Well, joining it's certainly us, not convinced, <laughs> Kyle. <laughs> Uh, joining us at the table on the presentation on proposed standards for the preparation of teachers of industrial and technology education are Sally Vaughn again, Flora Jenkins, as you know, our director, and Tom Bell from our Office of Professional Prep. Sally so you Carter. have before you uh, the proposed standards, and these are the results as is the typical process for Flora's uh, unit to do is to bring in uh, a number of stakeholders and had them reviewed by experts at the teacher prep institutions, uh, intermediate school districts. So with that, I will turn it over to Flora and to Thomas. Thank you. Good morning. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to be able to present to you the revised industrial and technology education um, endorsement standards. Um, as you may know, a few years ago, the superintendent had a work group called the Teacher Preparation Policy Study Group, and one of their suggestions was that we take a look at all of our endorsements and see if there's a possibility that we could reduce or eliminate some endorsements. And what we've done is combined the industrial um, technology endorsement with the technology and design endorsements to make them one and revise the standards to reflect that. Um, it used to be the old endor endorsement was the industrial arts, endorsement and that covered a lot of the things that, that students would learn in shop and woodworking and things like that. And then as technology advanced and grew and, and became more part of the industrial arts, we came up with the technology and design endorsement. And so now to have these two endorsements come back together um, and really get those teachers trained in how to use um, this advanced technology, also look at the professionalism involved and teaching students in those various areas. Um, so that's why we, we've done this. And um, I'm going to let Thomas just kind of talk to you a little bit about that group process and what happened with that and how these two groups of, of teachers and professionals out in the career area and working with our career and techno technology or career and tech ed um, folks here at the department, how this, this whole thing kind of evolved. And so Thomas, if you can kind of give a brief overview of that process. <laughs> sure. In, uh, 2009, roughly March, I think was the uh, month, uh, we brought together 23 folks from around the state, including staff from MDE, both in our office and career and technical education, and had a discussion on the future of uh, industrial technology and technology and design. And through that discussion, we talked about emerging trends in the fields, how to make the endorsement areas more vibrant and applicable to today's curriculum. And ultimately, the result of that conversation concluded with the merging of the two endorsements into one um, to assist with the preparation of teachers um, in, in being more marketable in this area and, and allow them to align themselves more to the current curriculum uh, happening in K, well, well 6, 12. Um, these standards were drafted uh, similar to most of our standards that we've been putting forth in the last few years. Uh, standard one is content. Standard two is uh, addressing career cluster knowledge, which is the career and tech ed relationship. Uh, standard three is instruction and pedagogy. Four is assessment. Five is professionalism. And standard six is technology and content specific technology. Uh, one of the things in standard three that I want to draw your attention to is the um, the new language, I think it's uh, standard 3.7, which addresses the common core standards. Um, in, a, in a preparing these teachers to be aware of how their content, so current uh, educational technology, um, is related to math, science, social studies, and English language arts. Um, and so that was something that the committee was very um, interested in, in adding to this. That is something that is new to this field. And, and, and will help them team teach, essentially. That's the hope, is that they will be allowed to team teach and, and, and have that, uh, that content knowledge. So um, I look forward to your questions, and um, thank you. Thanks, thank Thomas. You. Thanks, Mike. Tom. Board, board members. Well, I could say Kath and I, Nance. I thought that was a really good addition. I just, <laughs> first of all, I think it's, it's, it's really encouraged, I'm encouraged that you're looking at ways of combining these. So that's, that was really good, and I thought that including that reference to the standards, the Common Core standards, was really a good addition. So I really appreciated that. So I thought it was really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy. I likewise appreciated the, um, the way you streamlined all of this together. I do have a question on, on those uh, standards that do not have a level of proficiency or are not uh, given that it will either be pass, no pass, 
uh, but are in a gray screen, at least yeah. on my printout. Could you explain um, how that came to be? Typically, the ones that are the gray screen are not reviewed because they're the greater category, and then the elements within that are actually the ones that are the, the institutions provide right. documentation to. So, for example, 1.0 is the the catch-all, and then everything else is the, the and layers then 1. that... And 1.1 is still gray correct. screen. Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because that's talking about the, the content knowledge and specifics, and then the content knowledge, the elements within the content knowledge are broken down in 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 1.1, 
Did you not abide by the contracts and the agreements that we have with them? Um, we don't have a contract, but we have agreements with them about how they can operate and what they can do and not do. So that can be one way that they can become decertified. If we have sufficient evidence that any one provider is not doing well in, in the services they provide, then we do go back and, and decertify, if you will, or take them offline. However, with the evaluations we have, it's very difficult to line the students up with the actual, we're usually looking at aggregate results. Mm -hmm. So do you look at comments from uh, parents or teachers? All the time. We get and they're taken into account then? Yes. Yes, we, we get reports back all the time. In fact, we have letters from the public regularly that are responded to. Okay. Um, uh, now on the application process. Mm -hmm. um, I've been contacted by some right. people. And um, the transmission is by computer. Correct. There's no hard copy backup that's called for. And um, I understand there have been some glitches. What, what allowances are made in those cases? We're only aware of one glitch, which was according to the applicant. However, no one else suffered from that same difficulty at that point in time. Um, certainly, if someone were to have notified us immediately of a problem, we but would work with them on it. they didn't know about it. Yeah. So we, we will work with someone when we know about the problem immediately. Okay. I, we have other applications where we have entities applying, for instance, for the school improvement grant and things like that, where they are searching with us regularly and will notify <coughs> us if they're having difficulty applying and staff will remain after work to help them through that situation. So whenever we're aware of that, we, we try mm -hmm. to accommodate it. But um, mm -hmm. according to the case I heard about, they did not realize that it had not gone through. So. Um, do you see a possibility of requesting hard copy as an alternative? I would hesitate to go to a hard copy alternative, I, I mean but uh, backup, we certainly backup can. Backup is what I'm thinking. We can go to a backup if yeah. that's necessary. With there being only the one glitch, oh, no. I question <laughs> the necessity, but that could be entertained. Okay. Linda, to Marianne's point a little more, for me to understand, sure. is it possible that they that they wouldn't know it was <coughs> submitted? What yeah. would what would maybe? I'm trying to understand that myself because this happened in this case. Mm -hmm. You seem to infer that well, they have to know that it wasn't. Most schools are because we're using the the Megs system. Okay. Schools are usually aware if a, if a, an application has gone through or if it has backed off as as our providers utilizing that same sort of system um, and will tell us, they'll call us and say, I'm having trouble getting this to transmit or trouble getting this to submit. So um, we're not clear in this instance what happened specifically uh, that created the, the dilemma for them. Well, they're not either. I, I, I recognize that. According to them. And um, we're not aware of it evidently until they were rejected. A, so, a solution uh, which is being mm -hmm. proposed here is that we ask them to also submit to us at the same time a paper copy and then we have their paper copy on file and they can resubmit if we find that they've got a glitch. I think that Wait. would be great. Is that they yeah. had to know that there's something wrong with it and they didn't know it? Yeah, is that, is that the I mean that's what I'm trying to understand yeah. because I think uh, part of this, I think this was an authentic case. I know a little bit about this right. one. I do think that if you don't have some remedy like a hard copy, you could also have some that just missed deadlines and then say it didn't go through and all that. I mean, there's a, there's a potential for, on this point, Liz, please, and then Kathy. Well, it just seems to me, you know, when you, when you do your campaign filing, you get an immediate um, number back that says it was received time, you get a confirmation number, it's instant return on, online. Mm -hmm. And it would seem to me that if we had some system that whenever something came, you had an instant reply received, then the sender would know within seconds uh, whether it went no. through or not. And, you know, I, I, I really worry about starting to request all these paper copies because I think they just yeah. fill yeah. 
fill uh, well, what, what there. We, so in what truth, what we really asked them for is a, is a CD. Yeah. We just, oh. we, as opposed to a piece of paper, we yeah. just take well, the CD. Yeah, they could do a CD, is but, but I the think that that in, in, an instant receipt number. We, we would have to explore that with DIT. With yeah. DIT, but that might be another backup that yeah. would be even more efficient. Just so we'll some, some sort of a backup, right. Yeah. So we'll do one of those, yeah. and if the, the DIT would be the ideal one, but and if they can't do that, it'll be the backup, and, and we won't have that. I think it was Catherine and well, Nancy. I had so please, no, I'm sorry. Um, and I guess this kind of is the end result of all of this. Um, I know there's no appeal process, but maybe there should be, or some way for or someone for people to talk to. Well, who, in the spirit of that question and how we might do that, re, you started to say earlier, but remind us who's making that call now and how. The, the current process is that the applications come in and are reviewed by a committee. We have one staff member who works on SES, um, and, and that's the only person who spends much time on it. Um, if there are any issues, then they, of course they're raised up through through staff um, to my level. Uh, but in the, we're, we're dealing with a specific case here, and I, I hesitate to get into all of the details of that specific case. Uh, we were satisfied that staff had taken appropriate action. Can we look at an appeal case? Yes, a situation. Yes, we just simply will have to take more staff time to put that in place, and, and we can do that if, if necessary. Well, why we're, why we're the appeal that? process right here. What so. is it? Is there no pro no appeal process? Well, within the the form as it is, there's no appeal process. Within the plan, as it, I'm happy to hear you say this, that there is an opportunity. Staff, I've, had, I've been contacted by um, two different uh, groups, and both were uh, disturbed that there was no appeal process. So um, I'm glad you're in place and that this is now a possibility. We can we can work toward it. Okay, good. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Kath, and then uh, yeah. Nancy. I I've re we, some time ago we developed our own criteria for as for the supplemental service providers a number of years ago, and I I know now the what these criteria are defined in law, and I just wonder if. Our criteria are covered by these criteria. I have to plead ignorance to that right now, and I don't know the answer to that. I would, I, I can find out for you. Would you? Sure. I wonder if there. I want to make sure that the criteria Anyone else we thought were important. Can we hear the question? Well, the question is: Is the criteria that's established in law the same as what I, the board established? They, they seem, I mean, they're, they're SES. sensible criteria, but I wondered if, For SES. if, the, if there's uh, something that we did that's not included here. It should be. Added. SES providers are part of Title I, mm -hmm. and the provisions for who can or cannot be a provider are pretty much uh, federal guidance. Right. And then it's up to the state to develop an approval system, which is what we've done. So, so well, we well, that's what, you meant. I, what I before said before it was in federal, we had passed state board, yeah. and so what she's asking is, do they parallel or are they are they? They're not identical. Thank you. I mean, maybe we need to find out where they're not, but I think what I hear you saying is, is uh, they jeopardize the funding if we don't follow the federal right. way. Right. But we still should know. It would be comforting to know that, yeah, they're virtually the same, or no, here's a big glitch that's different, and then maybe and we, we would first advocate. And and brought it to the board. We included the idea that SES providers really should use use certificated teachers in the provision of that service, and that is not part of the federal requirement, and they were not allowed to put that into our our criteria. We were not allowed. No, not no. Allowed. This came, No Child Left Behind is what created this yes. uh, right. opportunity, mm -hmm. required it. And, you know, when this is us interpreting No Child Left Behind, 
to provide some sort of quality <laughs> contours. As you know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry and school district right. was interested yeah. Yeah. in providing these mm -hmm. supplemental services because there's money to be made. Right. Our job is to put even more um, quality assurances on who can do that so that they're actually educating, not um, providing fly-by-night uh, tutoring. Not babysitting, right. Right, that's mm -hmm. well stated. Well, Man's that's different. what I've... I, is there some way we can still we can't add that or we or we won't get funded? What, I would think that if we follow, we had at least their minimum, we could add our own additional criteria. Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to add that criteria. However, at this time, until ESEA is reauthorized, the current guidance stands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there some way we can? Lobby when they do no child left behind. That we can can make no <laughs> yeah. Put it in reality. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, what this, that's what the purpose of this is. is right. So we know what we want to change. Yeah, so that we ought to be pushing that at the, at the federal yeah. level, mm -hmm. Lisa. <laughs> well, when that, we hear you loud and clear. So when yeah. that, I, when that comes to pass and that will, you know, there's some right, debate about when we're going to actually do the reauth, but come to pass. when that's for done. My, for my money, they could eliminate this and put the money in something else. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, the effectiveness is not proven. That, that very concept is under discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yes, I okay. Just, there's almost more of, I think John captured the, the words pretty Tom well. Tom, Dick, and Harry, right. Tom, Dick, and Harry fly by night. I mean, this is a protecting process for our kids because mm -hmm. what ends up happening is you have some really good providers and then you have oh, some that right. you just shake your head and, the, and we're like going to have to... Just like we're, we're living within those constraints right now, but I'm, I'm, I'm confident that reminding you of a few minutes ago when uh, I think Linda talked about the evaluation of those, uh, I didn't... Did, to Marianne's question, are there some that have been decertified? There are, but not to the, not because of the evaluation component, because it's it's very difficult for us to get the child, the UIC for the child, against the SES provider. Uh oh. You've, you've got to go in and, and do that, so we can't do that. We're, it has to be a more global evaluation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, it, but the the bottom line results across the state are not stellar. No. Yeah. So even from that perspective, it gets money. to Kat's point about you know maybe a redirection of that money in mm -hmm. its entirety anyway. Nancy, please. Um, if, if we accomplish what Kathy's talking about, probably my question's moot, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Um, when we do the evaluation, do we stick strictly to the data that we have on the child's um, uh, or the aggregates uh, increase or lack thereof of knowledge? because of and the effect that the SES has had or do we also look at how the interaction between the school district and the SES has taken place? We look at both of those. Okay, because it seems to me that the communication, <clears throat> certainly my experience has been that oftentimes the SES doesn't know what to ask the school district in order to make good decisions. And so I'm just kind of wondering how that's working too. It, it's, it's a difficult piece and in, in some <laughs> districts in my experience and in, in what I've seen to date is that where it's a smaller situation, it's a much more manageable and the flow of information goes back and forth much more fluidly. Um, <coughs> when we're talking about larger districts and a variety of schools utilizing um, the same provider, it becomes more, more cumbersome and more difficult. One of the, one of the um, things that comes to mind that I've, I've witnessed oftentimes with SES providers is they will ask for the students' grades not their MEEP results. And one would hope that they were reflective of each other, but truly they usually are not. Very different. And so if, a, if an SES is focusing on a child's grades as opposed to their MEEP results, then their, um, the bang for the buck is not theirs, shall we say. Right. Um, and so that's why I'm wondering what kind of evaluation is done on the communications piece between what's really important in a child's assessment or an assessment of a child's ability versus what's apparent. Mm -hmm. if you, I think right, right. And the, the communications tool piece is is key and not always present. Right. Thank you. And just as an aside, I think I'd add to uh, what you said to about with Lisa's focus on this. My own association, CCSSO, is very focused on this as a broader area, and I'm sure that NAGB is, and mm -hmm. your input there is going to be important. As many large national groups, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think 
I mean this kindly, but I once in a while when I even hear intermediates and others trying to influence policy, um, these are pretty much done by large groups that have been able to say we've got, in effect, let's say all of the school board uh, nationally on or most of them on board for a given uh, issue. And if it's also with CCSSO, which typically it would be, then then that's what's really going to amount to some of the changes in this. So any encouragement I could give you to get NAGBE to yeah. to also weigh in on this as you see fit. Maybe NASBE too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, NASBE. Sorry. Right. Uh, NASBE. <laughs> I was wondering. Yeah. I was trying yeah. to figure out that. Yeah. Yeah. National I forget what NAGBE even boards, is right? now. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a NAGBE. There yeah. is right. a NAGBE. Yeah. But I think you meant NASBE. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. What is NAGBE now? I'm drawing a National blank. National Association of Governing yeah. Boards, isn't it? National Assessment, oh, Governing, Board. Yeah. National Assessment yeah. Governing Boards. Excuse okay, me. well, uh -huh. yeah. almost had it right. Get it? Right. Yeah. But I mean, that's where <laughs> this is really yeah. done, and and I think sometimes we have a lot of energy at at more local levels, and as if that's going to make. If, it, it, if you happen to uh, be in a spot though where you can influence, I, I've found out in my association the key thing is influencing the legislative committee. Yep. And you don't mm -hmm. need many people to influence the legislative committee, which in turn, inf that's why I'm staying on the board of CCSSO and re-upped, because you have more of an opportunity to have that impact, and they're not waiting for all 50 states. Oh, yeah. And then if you can have CCSSO with a given impact, that's going to be a lot different than a handful of us or four ISDs or something like yeah. that. In the same but on way. the other hand, if you have access to a person on the education committee, it helps. Yeah. It helps. It yes. helps. Yeah. It helps. Yes. Does. Sometimes one person can get something, you know. Yeah, but I, I would, I would, you know, we've even tested this at CCSSO, and when you really ask what are, the, try to name those things that have been different because of that, I think they're fewer than we think. Well, they might be fewer, but there's some of them. I, I mean, so anyway, we're trying to find works. one. We really, as we've been examining the way we do this. Probably not an either or. It's probably a both and. Right. I think yeah. we could try everything. Dan, please. I don't know if we were, well, I don't mean to cut our conversation short on the uh, SES question. I had a question, though, about the school improvement funds grant criteria, if it's all right to. No, please. Mm -hmm. um, so as I understand it, then, these funds would be allocated to um, schools on the persistently lowest achieving list uh, who have an approvable school reform turnaround plan. Um, the question is whether there are schools on that list that did not submit an approvable yeah. plan. Yeah. And how many are there and where are they roughly? How does that shake out? There are a handful that did not have approvable plans. Um, and they all are eligible to apply in our next round of, of funding. And so we would work with them <coughs> to get an approvable plan for the next round of funding. The majority of the schools, however, that submitted plans um, last spring to us, did submit approvable plans. We ran out of money before we could actually award it all. And so we think this might be a good opportunity for us to be able to support them now rather than waiting going forward. And then they can still apply for that second round of funding. Just Was there a pattern around these schools that did not have approvable plans? Do they tend to be... You know, are they all Detroit? Are they all over the place? Was there a particular thing that they tended to miss more they often were, than not? They were evenly split, and um, the majority of them just did not have a coherent plan. And for instance, I'm, I'm just going to pull a few out of my, you know, the, my memory, but uh, there was the one that wanted a flight simulator and yet was not a specialized school for aviation and there was nothing in the plan that addressed the need for a flight simulator. Um, we had a little, that kind of thing. It was, it was more that sort of thing than anything else. I, my own, uh, I don't want to say investigation, but look into this a little bit more. Is why it was interesting to me that one district where one school was approved and one was not, you could see even in my, from my view, less expert than, than Linda and some others who were looking at it, that one was clearly approved and had a plan, and the other one was just a bunch of programs that didn't have any continuity. And I think what I th think you and Mark, <coughs> Linda and Mark and others have done very well is in some of these invites where people have come in from the districts to learn about it. I think they're getting more and more. You have to have a coherent plan. This isn't based on just patching together 
three or four things that have no co coherence and then expecting actually to improve. So I'm, I'm more confident that in that one district, because I talked the superintendent through this a little bit, that did seem odd to me even at first that one would have kind of an outstanding plan and another one was was uh, subpar. But uh, I think that's 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 part of this process as they're all learning through it. You know, a little bit of this. And we also, as you know, Dan, I think we had the the discontinuity of the timing this year because the Fed timing was different than the state law timing on the reform. That's all going to be synchronized from here on in. But I, I, I was very pleased with the way this one superintendent responded because then he in turn looked at the in more depth at these plans and realized, you know what, one, I, I get exactly why your folks uh, were not, were trying to coach them to improve the plan for the next round. It was really just to be clear then, just wanted to make sure that, that our decision to fund, provide this additional funding to folks who had approvable plans wasn't, um, wasn't inadvertently penalizing a bunch of rural districts or, you know, high poverty urban districts or what have you that, so. Um, our, pl our plan is to go right on down the list um, and until we run out of money. And, um, and where we might have some difficulties, we'll, we'll do what we normally do with a grant and negotiate with them that, you know, here, here are some problem areas for us, would you please make some changes and then when you can do that, we'll be happy to release the dollars to you. But let's, I mean, can we just maybe, I think Dan's being uh, appropriate in the way he's asking this, but for example, there were lots of them approved in Detroit and some not approved in Detroit. Correct. Mm -hmm. And there, were, there are some coming up on the list that are approvable in Detroit that would receive this money and some further down the list that would not. Because right out of the block you have the disproportion. I mentioned Detroit only because out of the total universe of, of, of approvable, half for Detroit, mm -hmm. and of the half that came from Detroit, about how many percentage-wise were? There are six schools, six schools out of 28 that were awarded that are Detroit. Okay, and then how many totally were awarded statewide? 28. 28. Oh, 28. Six of the 28 were Detroit. It was disproportionate, disproportionate. Um, disproportionate based on the number of schools low. that were in the pool. Those schools have now had a chance, though, to write another plan because of the PLA list, and we're finding that those plans are much more substantive and more in much better shape. That's great. And these were the ones, if you recall, that I had sent a letter to both the board president <coughs> and Robert Bob saying we required them to sign, for both of them to sign these, and a little bit of the irony of today's controversy and yesterday's. Is, is why some of us were thinking up front that, that sooner or later this is going to be a self-determination issue again for a board in Detroit and no matter where you might have been on a mayor control or not a mayor control or a board or whatever, our view from the beginning has been you need this team working together on these plans because that's what's going to ultimately be. There won't be a financial manager at some point. There will be a board. Um, well, for a while we weren't, you know, we weren't sure if there was going to be a mayor issue, but um, so I think that's also been helpful that it's, uh, if I may just say so on our part, that it's forced them to kind of get together and I think they've done that in a better fashion uh, on this, this more current PLA round. Um, I, I think to just one more thing um, that you need to keep in mind. These dollars will go to these schools immediately and let them get started now where um, the SIG-2 dollars won't be available to them until much later, and so we're hoping that this, does, this helps the students get some services sooner rather than later and not have to wait until the next set of funding is available to them. Kathy. I wanted to ask, <coughs> Linda, when you say you go down the list until you run out of money, mm -hmm. uh, what's the list? Of the original the schools. Who's on top of the list and who's at the bottom? Well, I, I don't have all of that with me, and it, it's, it's divided. Uh, based on the ratings that the that the reviewers gave the the applications, and so where we stopped, the next school on that list is not a Detroit school, but is in the metro area. And I just happen to know that one, and then it, we just keep going down the list across the state and but trying to provide the dollars to them. These based are one-time. On it's based on the points, though. That's yes. what I wanted to yes. find out. How, mm -hmm. what, how does the list? Do These are one-time ARA dollars, so it's not something that we can continue to award and we thought this might be a good opportunity to provide some support to those schools. So I'm sorry, let me clarify. Please, now I've got please. a okay. question. Um, 
and I get this is just around the criteria, so I may be skipping ahead a little bit, but bear with me if you would. So 26 schools were funded with a school improvement grant funds. 28. 28, I'm sorry. Um, the, these funds would go to the remaining schools on the list, 29 to whatever, mm -hmm. who submitted approvable plans, mm -hmm. split it equ uh, divided equally between those schools. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And That's then, so the only schools who would not have any funding at this point to do any of the school improvement work, um, any additional funding would be those that did not submit an approvable plan. Correct. Got it. Okay. And there was, if I may say, I mean, there was some uh, tactics going on, I think, by some superintendents on whether or not to apply for a grant and what, if they, and I'm not judging that, I'm just saying they, they live with their own decision as to whether or not they submitted a plan or not. I think some of them thought they'd never be on the PLA list, that they'd get off by then, frankly. So they didn't apply for that, and then, then they're scrambling when they end up on the PLA list. And again, I'm not going to judge that other than to say they're responsible for their own actions. That's a, that's a little bit of what's created some controversy, but thanks for that question and clarifying it. Yeah. Other questions on... But, but that I, means then that, that there are some of the schools that really need help that are not getting funded. And, and, and the they community... probably need help the most if they can't come up with a, a provable plan. plan. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, in this <laughs> case, they didn't even, the case I'm talking about, they, they didn't even submit a plan. Oh, well. They, 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 you have some that chose to not even apply. Well, that's a, that's a problem. They need help, yeah. too. Yep. <laughs> what, I, what I do hear, though, Kathleen, is that that list of schools that did not have approvable plans is... Um, pretty randomly distributed um, based on the original list of yeah. persistently lowest achieving schools, um, which gives me some comfort. I, I <laughs> do agree with you that that does leave a whole bunch of schools and students who are desperately in need yes. kind of out of the mix. Mm -hmm. um, it probably, uh, from a policy perspective, though, to provide funding to schools to implement school improvement plans that don't have an approvable school improvement plan doesn't doesn't make it isn't, you know, isn't a wise use of resources. So right. let's encourage them, and it sounds yeah, like we are right. doing so, to get yeah. to, to have them put a, mm -hmm. a school improvement plan together that, uh, that is implementable, and, and they'll get some support. The, yeah, the, the next round of funding, uh, the training for that, begins the 5th of January. We're bringing the schools in, asking them to bring their plans that they've already submitted. We'll start working with them to turn that now into an approvable school improvement grant application. To be blunt, I mean, if someone has submitted a plan with very low points on this scale, I think there should be questions asked at a local level of how that happened. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's, it's, it, the review process is pretty um, uh, unbiased. And uh, so that's, to me, I'm, I'm more, uh, I, I would have the same feeling about how some of these kids are left now without the appropriate resources, and I would and have done this with some superintendents and principals said, you know, that was your responsibility to get in a plan that would have actually had some consequences to it, and you did not do so. Kind of leadership. Uh, I because need there to would have been some uh, be offering some assistance in well, grant writing. Yeah. That's what they're doing. But yeah. some of this is even, you know, the same district. Yeah. So there's, there's even some that thought this should have just been equally divided and, or prorated or something. But the problem is if it, I don't even want to paint a too specific an example, but there are some that is very much what you just said, Dan, that you could fund that on an, whatever an equal basis might be, and there was no way that that funding was actually going to have an impact based on that plan. I mean, okay, I but that leaves the, begs the question, how do we help those kids? Well, we don't through this grant, no, that's and that's, they're responsible for that. Okay, and I, and I'm always feeling a little bit we, like we're, is there that any our other staff. Is avenue for us to help that district or that school? I mean, these kids are left hanging. Not because of any action of the staff that I work with. That's no, what I, I'm trying I'm to do. No, I'm not saying it is. No. I'm just asking. No. What do we do? Yeah. You get the local board to be responsible. To help that and push right. Them to Where's the local decisions? board? Where's right. the local administrator? Yeah. Where's right. the local right. superintendent? Right. We're all a local control district, mm -hmm. a state. We hear that all the time. Why is yeah. the state mandating this and that? And then when they submit subpar, uh, awfully subpar <coughs> proposals, then we, you know. Well, you know, does the board know, the local board get all of the information without our telling them that? Well, do that's, we tell, that's a good do question. We, 
Yeah. Do we give them the information? Because the superintendent probably won't tell them. I tell you everything. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> no, that's a good point, actually. Maybe it's, it's a, a CC point. to the board president on we, the Mary uh, Alice and then. On the redesign plan, a letter is sent to the superintendent and the board president. Mm -hmm. Oh. First of all, mm -hmm. telling them this is your deadline, you have to send it. And then, second of all, after it's sent and approved, disapproved, changes required, or whatever, this is what happened when your plan was sent. So that information is shared with the board as well as the mm -hmm. oh, well, that's and, and with the school improvement grant um, applications, the letter was sent initially to the superintendent. The application had to be signed by the superintendent and the board president and the response went back to the superintendent. However, in that whole process, we asked for a preliminary application, and we read it and gave them feedback in order to improve mm -hmm. their application for the final reading. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Large, the Detroit chose not to exercise that, and other school districts did as well. And so if, if they didn't want our feedback, then they find themselves in the dilemma of they didn't get the technical assistance that was available to them. Maybe we should send a copy to the local newspaper. <laughs> you know, we have, on a serious note, we've, sure. we've talked at our soups group meeting it's at length about how much, particularly with the staffing issues, how much do we become more and more what we've heard the board talk about, which is a light of day institution, and right. then let local people make decisions based on. I, I can tell you a very high performing district that I mentioned, I might have mentioned more specifically, but they have two high schools and they're trying to figure out why their high schools are so different in this percentile. That's a great discussion. And, and there, there are some issues that would lead one to believe in that local district that one might have a harder time being at the same, but at least it's putting back to them the whys and what can we do. And I think the light of day is, is really a smart mm -hmm. point and can help us uh, I don't know that directly to newspaper as much, but certainly board presidents and uh, Cassandra, then Liz. Well, to that point, are these now public documents where a, a school that did not make the grade can now see one from a school that did and compare and contrast? They're all posted on our website. By federal guidance, we had to post all the applications once they'd been read and awarded or not. Hmm. Well, we ought to let people know that. They might not be aware of that. I think a good thing we're hearing is virtually a CC on everything to a board president. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and there's no downside or an alert to say if it come to our, is this, it, it, very much in the spirit of the last two soup group meetings where we're trying to get light of day, we've been thinking about these strategies. What do you push out? Because one thing to have rich information on a website, it's another thing that if people don't know it's there or know how, right. don't know how to easily use it, you have to push it out. And mm -hmm. we're trying to think through with Marty's division in particular how that we can push out meaningful information that would encourage someone to click, not just you know, because I've even found myself at times, I'm, I think I'm less guilty right now, but maybe two years ago I would have said, well, it's on our website. Now I'm more conscious when I hear enough feedback to say, uh-oh, it's not enough that it's on our website. Let's people, get this people out. People don't know it's on the website. Yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a strategy, a push-out strategy. Yes, Liz. Well, this, going to this information sharing thing, which I think <coughs> is really important. I, you know, I'm not a big fan of competition for dollars when it's the people most in need having to compete because they usually have the least resources to compete. You know, the, writing federal grants or things that comply with federal guidelines is, is a skill. And a lot of districts may not have that resource at hand, and I, it grieves me that to see some districts paying big bucks for consultants to help write these things because the money is going to the consultant, not to the classroom. But it seems we got a partner <coughs> in Michigan Association of School Boards, and, and I think a conversation of leadership of this board with the leadership of the Michigan Association of School Boards telling them that uh, at the local level there are these opportunities, some of the districts availing themselves of it, some of them not, some of them needing skills in grant writing. And it seems to me a project of the MASB could be some grant writing classes for their members that could be uh, helpful in making local decisions um, out there. I mean, it is a true, it's a local control state, but there's ways to empower the local control to 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 do it, um, and and I I really think it would be wonderful. I see at the federal level we're moving more and more to a competition for educational <coughs> resources, 
and the more competitive it gets to, to uh, you know, at that level, the more our local people, ourselves and our local people are going to need the skills to write successful grants. So uh, let's team up and uh, see if we can um, get too. the local boards up to, uh, with those skills to help their own districts. Yeah, makes sense. To that point, though, uh, the MASB does have uh, classes. classes and their annual and their, and their regional conferences on grants writing. I know. But what they don't have, which I think we could encourage them, mm -hmm. is how to assess the results of those. Yeah. Because this is all about where are the grants that you can go and write for. This yeah. isn't about what do you do when you're refused yeah. or when it's not successful right. or when you weren't part of the party sure. or whatever. And so I think that that bent needs yeah. to be brought just out. broaden it out. Yeah. And, you know, and not everyone goes to their training either. No, I think sometimes right. those who lead at NIST Le need, need at least, least yeah. go, and <laughs> those who need it most are not able to for all, all the other complicating factors, money. Can I suggest concretely on this one that we do a push out identifying the website to superintendents mm -hmm. and board presidents mm -hmm. for the review of the proposals and, mm -hmm. and that we do that tomorrow and mm -hmm. at least they can click on and get to it. Mm -hmm. Cassandra, you had something. No, I'm oh, oh, okay, good. That'd be great. Yeah. We good on that? Yeah. Okay. And Eileen wrote me a note that lunch is ready and it's seven minutes after twelve, so maybe uh -huh. we'll try to get back at one so we can we can. I know we're keep it at one. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you.